Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really excited and honored to have Inspired on with me today. Uh, obviously, a uh, player most of you, if you follow Pro, know very well. Uh, LEC and LCS MVP. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think you're the only person in the world with that. Yep, uh, I am. <laughs> former LCS champion, uh, potentially future LCS champion again. Uh, we'll see. But um, yeah, thank you for coming on. And uh, why don't you give a little bit of background about yourself too? Um, I mean, you've kind of described everything I achieved and uh, <laughs> I don't know what else I can say. I have been I've been playing at Worlds three times. I guess that's the okay. thing you didn't uh, say. And uh, I guess that's pretty good considering I only missed it once because I don't count the last split because I didn't really play. Fair. And uh, I guess that's it. I don't really know what else I could say yeah, about well, myself. Let's talk about your gaming history. You know, obviously you didn't start yeah. pro, but tell us a little bit about your background, you know, how you came up when you start gaming. Mm, I mean, I was always uh, playing games. Like I started league in like season three, but I was just playing for fun. Then I played, I switched to CSGO and then I switched back to league and I just went from game to game, just like uh, just playing games for fun. And uh, I never really thought I'm going to be a pro player, but I was pretty good at a very young age in the games. Like. The moment I started playing League, I think I got gold in like my first season, in season three already. And then when I kept playing, I got like plat and and uh, it felt pretty easy to me. Uh, so honestly, I just liked the fact that I was grinding and, and getting higher and higher elo. And it was going pretty smoothly for me. It was not like I got stuck in some of the elos. So I just enjoyed the, the process. And uh, other than that, I was playing football. Uh, in in a club sit, until I was like 13 or 12 maybe so, 13 I think so, so I was so, playing so it since I was a little kid now, now that you're in LCS though you have to call it soccer oh <laughs> I'm sorry guys <laughs> I'm just kidding but, uh, it, it was football it was football because it was in Europe yes yes true okay uh, and that, that makes me feel really bad because it took me three years to get to, to gold and then, <laughs> and, and then to plat um, yeah. but awesome so you know, obviously we missed watching you play last season. There's a lot of issues going on. You don't have to get too much into the details, but you know, what were some of the, the factors that influenced like your decision making? I'm assuming it wasn't purely just, oh, I didn't want to play. Uh, what were some of the things that were going on that kind of prevented you from playing last split? Mm, I'm not sure. I think there was some something inside of EG that just uh, they couldn't really let me play. I don't know what was it about because I was happy uh, to play either way, even though uh, we had to make some roster changes or like mm -hmm. EG told that they have to make roster changes. I was happy to play either way uh, because I didn't really find any better opportunities for myself, but uh, they decided to uh, to go with the other players. Yeah, that, that was really disappointing to me because I thought we'd get to see, you know, another split, uh, another season of you with uh, Jojo P and you guys had a lot of uh dynamic you know obviously yeah i mean year. i was also hoping for that that was very weird because it was during the off season where no one really expected it to happen and it just happened like that that we got informed that uh, we are not gonna be playing anymore uh, for the upcoming season so uh, it Jeez. was pretty weird and kind of sad yeah so so what was that like when you you know found that out and now you're thinking okay i'm, I'm teamless what was what was the thought process what was going through your head at that point I mean, I was uh, still under contract, right? So I, I told Digi that uh, like, I I'm going to stay in shape and if they want me to play, I will play. And uh, I was basically ready all the time. And uh, if they would want to use me, they, they could use me. So it's not like I was completely, uh, completely free and uh, looking for a new team. I was uh, kind of just uh, being on the bench and, and uh, that... waiting with my contract and, and seeing if they will need me. That that's actually crazy to me, um, because yeah. how how does that even make sense when you think about you know what one of the major issues last year uh, with EG was the jungle rotations right uh, yeah. going from Armeo going to Shaden back and forth they just could not figure out who to stick with and it, I think it really cost them in playoffs um, I didn't actually know 
that you were st i knew you were on under contract i didn't know you could technically still play I, I actually am not familiar with like why were you restricted from playing at all like you weren't on the roster or uh, i think this was like some management choice uh, um i didn't i i was not told why they yeah. don't want me to play uh, i said that i'm ready and if they want me to play i will play any moment that's, like uh, that's wild <laughs> yeah that, that was that's pretty wild. Wild. And, and, and for context i am not contracted with eg currently well nobody is now but um and, and obviously, you know, Inspired's now with FlyQuest. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I had to rock the I had to rock the Basil shirt. It's the only one I have. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting on the new one. Um, I yeah, I want to have one as well. Yeah, the only the only FlyQuest apparel I have. So if, if you want to send me a jersey, like let me know. Um, <laughs> uh, but what what are you uh, what are you thinking now for for the new season? You know, how are you excited? How how excited are you for the new roster? Playing with some new players. Uh, honestly, I'm mostly excited about top because I like I played against Buipo a lot in Europe. Then he came to to NA same time as me, and uh, he always seemed like a very solid and very good player that is like not uh, scared to take risks and push his advantages. So it I think it will be very exciting playing with him. I think me and him will match together in the game. Our view on the game seems pretty similar. And about the other players, like uh, I don't really. Like, I don't know, for, for Buipo, I'm for sure the most excited about. I'm also excited about to see how will Masu do, because mm -hmm. uh, people are telling me that he's like a yeah. new Danny, basically. Yeah, and, uh, mechanical, I'm, I mechanical mean, monster. I, 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 I can't wait to see it. So, <laughs> honestly, I didn't really watch his games in Academy, not gonna lie. So <laughs> I mean, I'm that was gonna... his, his big season was the season you weren't really playing, though. So, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, so right now, uh, you're back in Europe right now. What, what's it been like switching from NA solo queue back to European solo queue? Is, is, you know... So much better, man. Like, it's so <laughs> much better. I hate NA solo queue. But uh, you have to, like, uh, adapt, I guess. Because uh, yeah. in NA solo queue, I just play to make sure my mechanics are on point. I don't really practice the game, like, a, a strategical way. I think in Europe you have a lot of pro players even that are playing in ERLs and stuff. So mm -hmm. you can kind of practice the strategical uh, level of gameplay in solo queue, in like high rank solo queue. Mm -hmm. uh, but in America it's hard to get a lobby with 10 pro players. So most yeah. of the time the games are just uh, uh, one-sided by the team that has more pro players. Or if there is non -pro no pro players at all, then the game is complete fiesta. Yeah. So you just have to kind of adapt and I guess enjoy, enjoy the game. <laughs> enjoy you get a one game. trick on each team. You get yeah, a yeah. random streamer doing a challenge. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> um yeah that that's actually a good point too with the erls uh did you notice a difference i mean maybe because you were only here for a couple of years but did you notice a difference between last year and this year with the removal of nacl academy uh system was it was there a significant change in solo queue at all uh i don't think so i mean i didn't really notice it that much honestly it felt mm. pretty similar to me um mm. yeah I, okay. I don't think so, but at least in I mean in Europe the ERLs are like at so much better uh, like so much better organized than yeah. American uh, uh, scene overall. So in Europe there is like uh, yeah if you get to Challenger you basically if you get into Challenger lobbies you play against pro players all the time uh, even if they are not playing in the highest leagues they they have some sort of competitive experience so so the games are always on the on the higher higher that makes level. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about uh, Europe kind of underperforming this year at Worlds? I mean, honestly, I didn't see a world in which LNG, uh, uh, NRG is beating G2, but it <laughs> happened. So, I mean, well played to them. I, well I think a lot of them. people lost a lot of money on that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm betting, like, I mean, I'm betting, like, how, how, what was, what were the chances, like, before the yeah. game? Like, yeah. how many people would say that NRG is winning it? I, I think it's like 95-5. Yeah. Yeah, if I'm being honest, or yeah. maybe even less. Like G2 wasn't in fire like the whole tournament, or like maybe not whole tournament because they lost the game before the game against Energy, right? They they had a couple of games where they won, but they were they were behind and they somehow yeah. pulled it out, you know. But like I, I think but Energy, they still won. Uh, yeah, Energy but they still last year won. and they came from winning the split in Europe, which sure. uh, technically yeah. is a stronger league than than mm -hmm. LCS, but I don't mm -hmm. think it's. I don't think it was that big of a difference. I just felt like G2 is uh, way above uh, all teams from Europe or, yeah. and all teams from NA, and the other teams are on pretty equal skill. 
Yeah. But yeah, yeah energy did it, and I... uh, yeah, that, that that was fun watching it. Honestly, like yeah, that, I mean, it's it always fun yeah. to watch upsets. That that's why it's fun to watch the tournament itself. You know, you're always hoping for some massive upset. You know, like you know, a LPL team losing to the third seed from NA or something. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um. It's interesting though because I think that this season in LEC especially was kind of the weakest that we've seen LEC as a whole. But G two mm -hmm. still was definitely head and shoulders above pretty much every other team. Um, I think one of the big things that uh, LEC did differently this year was the three split system. Right, the the season was split into three. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of other coaches, commentators talk about how that might create competitive issues because you never get off time. You you're always basically trying to win rather than. Like, for example, in a two split uh, season, you basically have the first three to four weeks, nothing matters really, right? Like, yeah. And you, you've been through that. When we were you know, yeah. working together on EG, we talked about that a lot. Like, hey, it's the first three weeks. It doesn't really matter. All we need to do is improve into the last three weeks. Um, with the three split system, they don't really have that because yeah. by week four, every game matters. You know, by week three, every game matters already. So do you feel like that would, as a pro player, do you think that creates sort of an issue for you if you had to play in a three split system? Mm, I don't know. I think I would prefer playing two split system because mm -hmm. uh, I just like the fact that uh, you can you have time to improve as a team. You you are not forced to be good from the get go. And uh, even if the beginning is not uh, going that well, like for example, you are losing the games, but uh, maybe you are just losing because of some uh, teamwork stuff that you know you're gonna fix in 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 upcoming like weeks or upcoming days. Yeah. But uh, in LEC, those games might actually just uh, yeah might yeah. actually end your season and. Uh, and that's it. So I, I prefer for sure the, the two split season. And also, I think winning the split is just more more hyped because uh, playing free splits, I like when G2 was stacking the splits, they like won free splits and then they played uh, season finals. It just felt like they are playing a tournament after tournament, yeah. winning some trophy after yeah. trophy. And when there is just two splits in the in the year, it feels uh, more hyped to win it, I think. I, I agree. That's what I said when they first announced it. I was like, who's going to care about winning spring split now? Yeah. I mean, it's like one of three trophies that year, uh, and and uh, they don't even do like the the big uh, live audience right for the first couple. So it's kind of it feels watered down for sure. Um, with with the same same idea though too as a pro player, like as you're coming in, you were a major leader on EG, right? Like when when I first met you and you first came into that roster, uh, you did a lot of the shot calling. I remember you know being backstage and listening to kind of the player comms and all that. You do a lot of the shot calling. Do you feel like that's a role that you were put into or is that a role that they brought you in for like is that something that you developed or is that the reason they brought you into a team like that um i mean i think i mean they for sure didn't know exactly like what i'm gonna bring to the team right because it's kind of hard to know exactly what the player is gonna bring but i just knew that uh, i'm gonna be fine playing with the rookies because i have good view on the game and i know how to like uh, re uh, like how to lead the game for my team so mm -hmm. even though I was joining the team with a uh, rookie on both carry roles, I, I knew this, I would make this work mm -hmm. and I did. So yeah. I don't know, I think it's just my play style. I just like when everyone is organized and playing together because uh, I think that's the most important in, yeah. in competitive games. Do, do you kind of see that similarity coming into FlyQuest now? You have a, a rookie um, bot lane again, you have, you know, players a little bit less experience, except for top lane, I mean. I mean, I don't know yet. I think we'll we'll see when I start playing with them. Yeah. I think it will be similar, but I mean, the difference in mid is like wild because I mean, like very big because Jensen is obviously like very experienced player. Yeah. It's not like Jojo that I'm gonna have to <laughs> teach everything from the beginning. I think Jensen for sure has his way of playing the game and his habits and the way he wants to play. So it's gonna be way different than Jojo was. Do, uh, do you do you so... feel like in some ways that's actually a challenge? Um, maybe I think I, I've never played with a, a experienced player in the mid lane. Like when I was playing mm -hmm. with Larsen, he also yeah. just started playing in LEC, yeah. and then with Jojo, he also just started his his like pro career in the highest level. Uh, mm -hmm. Level, so it's gonna be something new, I guess. Cool. Uh, and th this is something out of curiosity now too for me. Um, uh, when when you're being scouted for a team, or you're be you're talking to the managers, you're talking to the coaches. How much emphasis do they put on player responsibilities, player roles and that stuff? I mean, obviously, everyone knows you're a talented player, right? Mechanically, you, you have the game knowledge. Do they talk a lot about how personalities are going to fit, how, how you're going to integrate with each player um, when they actually put the team together? 
Mm, I don't think people really do that. I think it's it's good to do that, but I, I think some teams don't really do it and some teams overthink about it. Like, sure. I don't think you have to match personalities so well to be good as a team. Because sometimes even if the personalities are not like uh, very similar, it's good because then you kind of like uh, try to work together and 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 get to know each other mm -hmm. and uh, some people just don't like when things are changing also like for example when i played with larsen he liked uh, to play his way uh, so i kind of had to more adapt i think to it mm -hmm. and uh, i'm more of a flexible side so i can adapt to someone playing uh, their way or i can also if no one has direction in the game i can be the one giving direction and and making sure everyone is on the same page so i think uh, character wise it depends i think i have never seen a duo that you can say okay those two can't match because their characters are way different i think that's not really a case yeah at the pro level right i mean it's yeah. kind of expected that you sort of learn from adapt from your teammates um yeah. and then coaching staff you know like uh you've worked with coaches who have been pro players and you've worked with coaches who have basically never made it out of you know silver uh, yeah. So, do you think that there's a huge discrepancy in the ability to coach when it comes to being able to play the game? Um, I'm not sure, honestly. I have never been a guy that uh, uh, got so much out of coaches. I think mm -hmm. I'm the I'm like analyzing so many games on my own mm -hmm. that uh, I kind of I kind of learn from just replays and from my own experiences playing the game. So. I, I, yeah, I was never never really a guy that would like ask my coach a lot of questions or, or try to learn from this. Oh, okay. But uh, honestly, I think it's better if the coach plays on the high or like highest level, at least high level. I think uh, it would be kind of weird if there is a coach in the top team that is like silver or, or bronze. I think it's just a little bit too low, Elo. I, I, I think even if you... Uh, yeah. if, even if you watch screens every day, I feel like you might just get to diamond just on default, on default because you just watch the game right every day. I feel even more low elo now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but I guess it also ties into the question like, what is the coach's role then, right? If you're not learning from your coach in terms of how to play the game better, what should the coach's role be? Let's say head coach versus strategic or or a positional coach. Yeah, in my opinion, like head coach should be the guy that leads the team outside of the game, the mm -hmm. guy that uh, does uh, outside of the game things for the team, it, which is making sure that uh, everyone is working together, everyone is in the review focused. Uh, if someone is making mistakes like, uh, I don't know, having a worse day, he will just talk to him and see what's, what's up with him, if it's just a, a bad day or something happened. Uh, someone that is just good at uh, talking in real life. Yeah. And I think more of the game staff, like anal analysts, I think should be doing uh, uh, things that help you prepare for for the team that you are facing. Mm -hmm. And if there is someone that needs uh, uh, like a personal coaching, I like the the style of as of what you said. It was the positional coaching. Positional coach, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's good for for new players. Yeah. And if if they don't have someone in the team that can uh, uh, try to help them with that, because I think not every player has ability to like teach their their teammates if they are like more experienced. I think in our team, me and Buipo are, are gonna be really good at it. So I don't think uh, Maso will have much issue with that. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna be able to help him a lot. But in some teams, maybe you don't have uh, that much experience and then uh, some positional coach could be good. But I have never worked with anyone, at least for me. So mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to judge mm -hmm. how, how useful it is that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think ev like every team is also going to be different, right? Like depending on where your rookies are, if you have a rookie top laner, you might have to think about the team dynamic a little bit differently mm -hmm. than having a rookie bot laner, where as a bot laner, at least you have a support literally there you know, holding yeah. his hand, essentially, like telling him like what they can and can't do. Um, I, that, that's sort of what I was getting at with the, the team structure. Like, how does a team approach organizing and putting together a roster? Because I think, you know, it's preseason. Everyone's seeing all the rosters getting announced. Everyone's getting all hyped like, oh, this team's going to win. This team's not. We're going to talk about that later. I want some predictions. Uh, <laughs> but um I think every team does it differently. So I think, you know, EG, we keep going back to EG as an example, but, you know, EG last year kind of, they, they kind of took the idea that you could build a team around analytics and have it overperform compared to what you would say on paper. Like each of these individual players on paper, you wouldn't say is going to be a top four team, right? Or a top four player, but they managed mm -hmm. to make top four. 
So yeah, I, I think there's some element of like, okay, maybe especially with sort of the budget cuts, no, no, no team right now is going to drop a million dollars on a player anymore. Like it gets really hard to say, is it worth it to overinvest or do teams have to start looking at fundamental structure differences? Like how do we make players better now? I mean, I don't know. It's really hard to make a player better. Like how to find a new mm -hmm. talent. I don't know. Like how did Jojo start? I, I, I don't know. He just uh, played Fortnite and then yeah. uh, switched to League and ended up being good at games and yeah. he liked yeah. just grinding the game. Uh, so If I remember, he went from amateur straight to... Uh, did he? Uh, he might have played Academy. No, he didn't play Academy. I think he went amateur. He, play, he played Academy. Oh, he, he played Academy. He played he Academy yeah. split, right? Okay. Oh, oh, it was Danny did not play one, Academy. I think he played one one year. Yeah, Danny didn't yeah. play Danny, Academy. Danny, Danny went straight went... amateur. Yeah. Uh, and Danny as well. Like he, this guy didn't have experience, but his mechanics were just like when when I watched him play team fight, he wouldn't die. Like it, yeah. it was it was just something weird yeah. in yeah. in his head. He could think about everything that is going on around yeah. him. That he could just not say a single thing, but he would just not die. Enemies would not get into him, into his range, and uh, he would be able to still deal as much damage as possible. And that was just it's him. Like and the, the yeah. perfect spacing, just being aware of every yeah. threat. Yeah, it, it was crazy to watch, actually. And then also, for me, from my perspective, he had the craziest mechanics because he played with his fingers straight, and it always. Yeah. Like, I was like, "How do you play like that?" <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I I think you know in terms of you're like i guess since you're the jungler right you, you kind of view the game from a different lens than uh, pretty much every other role which is always considering laning right or like individual <laughs> 1v1 type things um how do you think you approach developing as a player on your own right because you said you don't get a lot out of direct coaching but clearly you're watching vods clearly you're analyzing other junglers like what are some things that go through your head when you think about identifying your areas of improvement and how to work on those um, I think mostly like uh, what I think the, the the hardest or like the thing you can learn the most as a jungler is like how to play in team fights and when are you supposed to keep your spells and when you are supposed to like engage because uh, I think the, the that's the things that win the most important games. For example, if I'm playing Java and I'm gonna keep my combo for like extra three seconds instead of using it uh, instantly at the beginning of the team fight, I think this will come with experience and with uh, a lot of game knowledge because you know you are not forced to use your spares instantly and uh, then you use them in the perfect moment and you will basically set up the whole fight for your team. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, the biggest difference between like very experienced junglers and kind of rookie junglers, that the experienced ones, they will wait more for for a good moment, for the good opportunity to do stuff. And the younger ones will probably just like see the angle and instantly go for it. And, uh, and yeah, if they fail, they will learn from it. But... Uh, it just takes a little bit of time, a little bit of mistakes. Because at the beginning, I remember I couldn't play champions like Jarvan. I couldn't play champion like Sejuani because I just, I just, if my spells were up, I would instantly use them. Mm -hmm. And for example, Jarvan, if my E is coming off cooldown, I'm gonna instantly use it forward, just trying to make sure that I'm useful in the game. But uh, yeah, after a lot of deaths, I realized that maybe that's not the best way to play the game. <laughs> maybe I need to look if my carries are able to deal damage or if I'm actually needed to use my CC on enemies, or maybe my job is just to stand still, watch, and wait for enemies to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's the areas you kind of need to improve the most as a jungler. Interesting. Okay. And then how do you feel about diversifying champ pool? I know that meta kind of dictates each season, like the top three or four champions that every villain has to know, but how do you feel about like keeping some pocket picks, you know, having some of those diverse champions? I know um at eg like impact had a few of those you know everyone had their own little pocket pick that they really liked um yeah. do you think it's important to diversify or to get really really deep and strong on like certain meta champs um i think like for example i didn't have any problem playing any meta champ and then i just started playing some more champions that no one is really picking up but for example if you want to learn a lot of pocket picks in jungle i don't know you want to learn fiddlesticks you want to learn shaco you want to learn something else you have to like legit play hundreds of games on yeah. each of them because they are very complicated and very complex jumps while mo most of the meta champs are not maybe easy but you basically play against them every single game 
So, I mean, every single game. Or like you watch them play or you are, they are being picked every second game either by you or by the enemy. And then you, you learn just by watching them, not really playing them. But champions like Shaco or Fieldsticks, you have never seen them in the game for so long. So you are forced to pick it and you are forced to play that 100 games on him to, to learn it. So I think it kind of comes with the passion. Most of the youngest players have like very weird picks because they just play the game all the time. But I think, first of all, you kind of need to learn all the meta champions. I think it shouldn't be in the order that you are playing pocket picks and uh, the best the strongest champions in the meta you can't really perform on them yeah do you think the meta is something that develops naturally through solo queue is or it something that you guys theory craft and you're like oh what you know you watch all the other regions and you're like oh these champs must be strong um because I, I can imagine in certain situations right like you could pull a really weird pick and it would actually make it very very strong but uh, i don't think we saw a lot of that in lcs last year um there were not too diverse uh, drafting. I mean, the meta is basically like uh, what everyone will come to conclusion is uh, the easiest to win at, right? For example, Oriana was meta because she was the strongest in lane. She was scaling very well. And uh, it's just broken. I mean, there, there is just there is not just not much you can do against her. So yeah. she's meta. But if someone would find like a peak or two peaks that would be uh, suddenly good against her, I think she would fall a little bit down in the meta and she would not be first picked anymore. Yeah. So. I think you just usually come to the to the champs that offer a lot to the team, like uh, that either have CC or they have a lot of damage or a lot of scaling or a lot of wave clear. And then if their numbers are good and it's hard to push them out of lane or how to ha hard to bully them overall in the game, then they usually become meta because mm -hmm. uh, that's something you need in competitive play, just CC, uh, wave clear, engage and this kind of stuff because it's just easier to play with it. Yeah. And uh, if those champs are not movable, then then they become meta, basically. Interesting. Yeah, so one of the things that I, I thought a lot about uh, in just working in LCS is uh, something I've heard a lot of teams say, right? Whenever they go to MSI, whenever they go to Worlds, is, hey, we have this really, really strong style that we played all season, all split. This is how we play. Now that we're going to Worlds, we need to learn new styles of play so that we can compete against Asia. How do you feel about that? Um not sure honestly i think it's hard to say i think it, it it was it was depending on the meta as well because the the worlds in season 10 that dam won won i think uh, before going into worlds uh, china and uh, korea they were playing a lot of needly i think and graves and in europe and america no one really picked those champs and then when you go there and they pick pick them and you realize that you can't really deal with them with other champions uh, rather than just matching them then you kind of have to either ban everything and try to play your stuff or, or adapt and play what they did so i don't know i think it always depends on every year because some years yeah. i think even this year like it's not like eu came uh, to 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 worlds and they had to suddenly switch their play style like g2 and energy i think they played pretty much what they did in in their seasons yeah so i, I think I this, mean, this, this season, year there was not much yeah i mean i'm in i'm in Bawila, but this season has felt like you could play a lot of different styles and it still works um there's there's a lot of early game comps that work there's a lot of early game champs there's a lot of late game champs it, Actually, it the, the meta the meta switched during the tournament. I think during the yeah, tournament, everyone yeah. started playing the range bot lanes yes, again yes, because they realized yeah. that they're actually not weak. And uh, you basically picking them. You you have a high uh, you have you have a high advantage in the early game that it will basically mean that uh, you can control the whole game. So right. you have to match it. And so do, do you feel that, like that's that, how the meta yeah. evolved is at that, the beginning? It, it seems yeah. a little bit slow though, right? Because for a long time, I think a lot of even academy and amateur level uh analysts were saying why are people just blind picking nautilus yeah you know like it I just mean... you know but but it's comfort you know i guess a lot of a lot of pros like the option like go button right they engage you can just immediately start a fight um but but then they started saying okay well if, if we play double range then you can't even play like yeah um so that, that's always interesting because those dynamics i think don't really ever change unless the relative power level of each champ shifts and people just aren't trying it or aren't aware of it yeah, um, I think in NA at least it was probably like the rent champions started losing a bit in scrims and people were like, okay, let's just play melee champions because we are winning with it more. And then uh, it went to the stage and no one really, I mean, everyone kept playing the tank champions because I know energy won the split because, I, in my opinion, because it was perfect Ignar meta, like perfect yeah. support, engage. He, he just loved that meta. He was playing Alistar and, and stuff like that every yeah. game. 
uh, and they won the split and then uh, they went towards they started playing it as well but uh, uh, when the the better teams started playing it just seemed like they practiced in scrims like someone blind pick Alistair against them and probably Keria said let's try Ash I think it's gonna be good right and then he won with Ash once the other team picked it up and then it just snowballed into every screen block oh, and yeah. everyone re realized that okay I guess we can't pick Alistair anymore because they will just play Ash <laughs> it was like it was like last year when everyone started playing Heimer and it had like Nobody yeah. was winning on Heimer except for Barrel. It was so bad. <laughs> but I guess it was so disgusting in scrims, everybody kept banning it or picking it. Um, yeah. I heard a lot of people talking about, like, in scrims, it was just completely broken. But then on stage, it never showed up. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So, like, do you think that meta is something that evolves organically, or can, can it be something that's shifted directionally? Like, should coaches and analysts be putting more effort into trying to break the meta or should they be trying to perfect the meta that exists? I think it depends because there are some metas like, for example, when Maokai jungle was meta, in my opinion, this was not movable. So you should mm -hmm. try to perfect your uh, your playstyle, playing with Maokai and playing with AD carry mid like Tristana or Jace and uh, you should perfect it. But when there are some other metas like the tank supports, like uh, when you know that they are not like super OP, they are meta because they are meta right now. People think they are meta, but you can look for counter, speak, counter picks to it. For example, to Maokai, to Maokai, I felt like he has so much kit. In, I mean, he has like so many possibilities in his kit and he's just so strong with, with his stats that it was hard to move him. But the tank supports, I think you can, you can find counters to it. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to realize like if it's meta because it's just broken, like the numbers are too high, or is yeah. it meta because everyone is just playing it and you can actually find counters to it. Right, that makes sense. Like Orianna, there's just no arguing that Orianna yeah. was like a tier one mid lane. Like it was, it was completely busted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, getting away from league talk for a little bit, uh, what are some of your like goals in coming back to North America outside of league? Do you have any things that you want to pursue this year? Outside of league, I'm not sure. I've been going to the gym when I had off season right now because I didn't have anything to do, so I want to keep like good habits, I guess, while yeah. I will be playing. And other than that, I don't know. I'm like so ready to play again. Like it's yeah. been so long and. It's really boring to just uh, sit in home and not be able to play competitive games. So yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to start screaming again. And, I'm sure. Yeah. After after that long of being on that schedule, like sitting yeah. at home, just you know playing solo, he must feel like. Yeah. And also, I felt like I was in. I really felt like I was in my peak form, even though when we lost playoffs in spring. Yeah. I think like the the way I viewed the game and everything around me. I, I just felt like yeah, I was really in the zone and uh, I have never felt that confident in the mm -hmm. game. And that was very sad that going into summer, I, I got told that we are not going to be starting. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. I still think like uh, right now when I played, uh, played some screams with like, uh, I mean, not screams, like in houses and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just feel like uh, I'm in my top form and, and I can't uh, wait to, to show it and That's to great. play again. Well, next, next season is going to be a bit of a banger with uh, all the changes to the game itself now, right? Like it's... Oh yeah, actually I forgot to say about it. Like I, I just tried out the new map. It feels a completely different game. Like yeah. everywhere you go, like every river fight you take, like there are complete different flashes over every single wall. When you flash over one wall, there are like random walls appearing in front of you and your brain is completely not used to it. Like I was playing 10 years the game and the walls were completely different. Like what am I supposed to do now? Like yeah. I think I it will take me at least like 20 or even 50 games to get used to it. It just, I, I it mean, just I, feels so unnatural right now. I, I think this is really going to change the workload, at least in the first split for teams right uh yeah. do, you, do you foresee you know because of these massive changes everyone's gonna have to be learning so much one i can see a lot more volatility between teams like teams that we think are going to be really good might not be as good in the first split because mm -hmm. everyone's learning all this again yeah right? i agree i agree yeah. especially in the early weeks yeah so it'll be really interesting to see which teams are actually uh are able to adapt faster um yeah so yeah are you are you uh are you liking the map uh i don't know <laughs> it, it was just the one game so far okay. i went in custom and then we played one in-house and it felt it felt weird like i flash over the wall and there are like two different walls that i have never <laughs> seen before i'm like okay what am i supposed to do now so uh, yeah and then, I, it's yeah. too early to give my opinion i don't like them changes like map changes i yeah. like when there are champion changes i like when there are item changes i like when there are like uh, gold changes for example you get uh, 
uh, I don't know, XP changes that you get less XP sure. from jungle camps when it happened, but I don't like the map changes. Like, yeah. I, I, it just, it's just something that you have to get so many games in to get used to, uh, used to, because yeah, as I said, I was playing for the 10 years and the map hasn't changed. And right now the, or like yeah. not 10, but when the map <laughs> got reworked, it hasn't changed since then almost. Uh, so it just feels so different. Uh, I thought I had actually, uh, when they first announced it was, how many challenger level players do you think are going to be unable to hit challenger for the first like six months because they oh, have to relearn I think, everything i think there might be a lot of them <laughs> i feel like i don't know i it, honestly i'm saying like after this one game it felt really like a different game in some fights sure. it's just yeah. like you are playing league but you are not as confident in every click as i was before because mm -hmm. the walls are different i don't know if i like can kite to the right side and then flash up uh and and wait for my cooldowns because it just feels a bit different everything like the walls <laughs> the walls are shorter the yeah. brushes are not there i don't know it just feels i, I actually don't know if they announced it or yet or not but um do, do you know if they're doing champs queue next year um i think so yeah. at least in europe the champions queue is coming soon i think okay. so okay. probably in america should be there too how do you feel about champs queue versus solo queue and versus scrims um like, how, how you juggled all three I mean, I, I like screams by far the most, right? On screams, uh, I try to always put my like best focus and make sure everyone is really focused because it's only six or five games a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you can by far learn the most mm -hmm. in them. And in Champions Q, I think Champions Q is still better than uh, than Solo Q if you want to practice something some certain things in the game. Like, I don't know, if you are support and you want to focus on uh, having good uh, Rift timer. Uh, then it's better to play champions queue but if you just want to play for mechanics i kind of like playing solo queue just playing off roll either top yeah. or mid and and just playing uh, playing the game for fun because i still like the game so yeah. so why would i want to go champions queue and go with in comms with everyone and and play like yeah. it's a competitive game if i just want to play for chill and and play to yeah, just just play for fun and test my yeah. mechanics yeah, that makes sense. That's kind of what I was talking to an academy player or uh, NACL player last year about was how to structure practice differently. Like they should be trying champs they're not familiar with in solo queue in order yeah. to perfect the mechanics to try in champs queue. And then once you feel confident in champs queue, then you tell your team, hey, I can play, I don't know, uh, I can play Scion ADC now. Let me try it. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I think a lot of a lot of fans will look at solo queue as like oh you're lazy or you're not lazy like yeah. they, they think of it as like if you're not playing 10 games of solo queue a day you're you're not you're lazy and it's like there's so in, many my, in my opinion that's not the case at all in america yeah. i don't think uh, numbers of of games in solo queue are equal to the uh skill you have i mean obviously if someone is not playing and uh they play screams and then they uh, start playing some different games they don't they don't care about league then obviously they, they are slacking but there are players that uh, just same, similar to me maybe that they just watch replays or they watch their own votes from screams for example after screams i like to sit for an hour and just see what we did through the whole day like what was everyone doing during those games and what i was doing mm -hmm. and that's for sure way more productive than playing two games of uh, solo queue I, I agree. I, I've noticed that same mentality with a lot of veteran players. Uh, so Blabber last year, um, like yeah. first split, he, he barely played any solo queue um, because he was basically like keeping himself fresh. He didn't want to burn out by the yeah. time we got to the summer. He knew he was going to grind in summer and he did the same thing. He watched VODs of every other region. He did a lot of VOD review. Impacts, the same thing. He barely played solo queue, watched a lot of VODs. Um, I, I think it just has to be something that is uh, unique to how you learn best. I do yeah. think if you're a rookie, you should probably be grinding more games. But yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, what are you? Have you been working out? You've been you've been keeping up with it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. You're you're getting pretty. I'm on the, I'm on the grind. Yeah. All right. I'm All on right. the grind. When you when you get back here, we're, we're gonna we're gonna see the uh, the arms, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, I gotta know. So now that you know, this has been brought up a lot, but now that JoJo is on the other side of the rift from you, are you gonna be camping his lane? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> that guy is so annoying. I can already see how annoying it is to face him. You're going to be uh, nodding at him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think games against Cloud9 will be really fun overall. I, yeah. I want to see how they will like uh, match as a team. Because I don't think Jojo is a good... Uh, I, I don't think Jojo has a good playstyle that will fit Fudge's playstyle. I think mm. Fudge is way different than Jojo's. And 
I also feel like Blaber is a type of guy that sometimes needs someone to stop him from from going yeah. for the play. And I yeah. think and I think and I think both Vulcan and and uh, Jojo don't have it. I think on on Cloud Nine uh, in the previous uh, years they always had someone that would stop him. But I think this year the those three will always be happy to fight and be happy to uh, look for the outplays. So. Yeah. Yeah. That might end up very good, and they will be just smurfing all, yeah. all over everyone. But uh, it can also end up being pretty bad in some clutch moments in, sure. in important games. I'm curious what you think the stylistic differences between Fudge and uh, and Jojo is. I mean, I, I kind of know Jojo uh, being, you know, like. Yeah. yeah, I think Jojo is just way more aggressive than Fudge. I think Fudge I takes small victories. He doesn't want to take too many risks, and Jojo is like. Uh, He's gonna take a 50-50 if he has one in front of him because he knows it's not gonna be 50-50 because he's gonna outplay the enemies. Yeah, that makes a lot so. of sense. I think it's maybe also how Fudge was coached by you know like Max Waldo and all that. Like he he thinks about the game as the right way to do things. Yeah, like this yeah. is the correct move. And then JoJo's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna skill check you. <laughs> like yeah, do exactly. you have hands? <laughs> um, no, that's that's it's exciting. I, I'm really really excited for the split. Even though we lost two teams, it's gonna be an eight team split. Um, I, I still think that there are four or five teams I'm really excited to see how they develop over the year. Um, if we were to get a preliminary, obviously nobody's done any scrims yet or anything. You haven't seen anyone play as a team yet. Who do you think your top three is going to be? Obviously, um, FlyQuest. We, we, we could just leave FlyQuest out. Ignoring FlyQuest, who do you think your top three? Ignoring FlyQuest, I mean, I still think, I mean, Cloud9 seems for sure like the best team, right? There's like no. Uh, really surprised behind it. I think Jojo is the best mid laner, so and mid lane is OP role, so he might be able to lead his team. But other than that, I think uh, 100 Thieves is very hard to judge because they have a rookie AD carry, right? A rookie yeah. top laner. It's like Korean mid jungle. It's gonna be wild, like how this team goes. I can see them be really bad, but I can also see them smurfing. Like if the top laners end up being a, a second Jojo, but of top lane, and uh, yeah, there will be smurfing all around the rift. But the safe bet would be Liquid, obviously, because mm. they have uh, they have Core JJ impact. Like they are very veteran players, and yeah. I think they will always be at the top of the table. And other than that. I don't know. In my opinion, energy winning was very lucky, so I don't think they will uh, they yeah. will do it again. Uh, that, that's actually that's been a common consensus about NRG. It was that you know they won a split, they did well at Worlds, but yeah, they they lost some of their coaching staff, they lost some of their support. But staff. I just I, yeah. I don't know. I, I I need to see it on my own eyes before I believe it because the last split I played, I like free out them really easily. Like <laughs> I felt like I'm playing a very noob team. And then I leave, and they win the split. They beat everyone. They look like the best team in the league. Then they beat G2, yeah. and I'm just sitting here at home, and I'm like, "What? What happened to those guys in one split?" I mean, it, it goes to the idea that maybe they maybe they can get better, right? Like maybe a team. Yeah, can I mean, get maybe, better. but yeah. I just I just don't I I don't trust them yet until I play against them. Like, sure. I think sure. after I will play against them in scrims, and I will see that they actually improved so much, then I think I will change my opinion about them. But I, I need to see. So I think. Uh, FlyQuest, Cloud9, and uh, Team Liquid are top three. Fair. And uh, I don't know who who is after us. It's okay. kind of hard. Yeah, yeah. It's it should be good. Uh, uh, all the rosters look very very different this year. So except for NRG, which I don't know if they fully announced their roster so far, but they've announced the three core are, re are returning. Um, yeah, it should be interesting. Um, are there any I guess habits that you have specifically, uh, and like? You know, pre-game routines that you like, uh, certain things that you do, sort of like a ritual to get yourself ready to compete. Uh, I mean, I like to not really meditate, but just like to calm myself down before the games, just mm -hmm. to make my make sure my heart rate is uh, uh, low and I'm not getting too excited before the game, uh, because I think it just uh, you don't need the emotions of the excitement, especially in game one or like in best of ones. Mm -hmm. I think you have to go into the game like. like calm and and know what you are supposed to do with the champs you draft and and just just play your game yeah. so i like to just go into room alone and just uh, sit there with my eyes closed for like a 10 for 10 minutes or something just just to chill awesome yeah and then if for for any lower ranked players who are trying to climb go pro uh, eventually compete against you you know do you have any advice for how they need to think about getting there um I'm not sure. I think just play the game, get good mechanically, and then once you start getting uh, 
on the level where you like know how to play a lot of champions and stuff like that you have to start thinking about what advantages you can get into the in the game like uh, for example when the game is even you can think okay maybe i can roam on these timers if you are playing mid lane maybe i can invade those things or maybe i can try to get level six faster and do some play with it uh, but at the beginning i think you don't have to focus that much on the macro game you just focus to on your mechanics and improving your your clicks and i think uh, once you get there, you should be able to get challenger easily just with clicks and not much of thinking. And once you get there, you can start experimenting and like learning more in-depth stuff. I, I feel like your experience might be a little bit skewed, <laughs> but because <laughs> I don't think most people get to get to diamond period, you know, with a lot of effort. But I, I, I understand it. So mechanics, just play the game a lot, get very, very good at what it is that you do, and then you know, what's that transition like going from solo queue to, to pro? That's always been one of the biggest things for me in terms of going pro and league is there's not a good transition from solo queue yeah. to going pro. Um, yeah, I mean, th that's that's hard. I agree because the teams want you to be good instantly, right? And mm -hmm. if you are just a solo queue player, it's not like you're going to be good instantly. And some players are never going to get good. If they are solo queue, just just playing solo queue and then they get into the team, they will never get good. But there are some players that are bad at the beginning, but they will actually get good. So it's hard to actually know for the team to stick with that player or should I try a new one? Or maybe I should just go for someone I know that he's already performing. So I don't know, that's a tricky question. I think you have to uh, have a good eye for a player like yeah. uh, Peter Dan had in, in EG. Mm -hmm. And he, he chose both Danny and, and Jojo and both ended up being really top players on the roles. Yeah, yeah. It, it'd be interesting to you know understand a little bit better about how they where the eye comes from, right? Like, is there a way we yeah. can kind of make it a little bit more qualitative? Like, oh, this is what I look for. This is specifically, you know, what marks a, a solo queue monster. Because we've seen so many players who hit rank one repeatedly on the server and yeah. they never make it out of academy. They, they just can't yeah. get to that next level. I mean, I don't know, honestly. It's really, it's really hard to tell because, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But then, yeah, it's, you're it's absolutely really right. tough. You, yeah, you see some challenger players who like, don't necessarily hit top 50 on the ladder, but then they do great yeah. pro. You know, they, they understand the game at a, at a competitive level, which is much more team-based. Um, but okay, uh, last question then, I appreciate your time and all this, uh, is I, I always ask every pro I work this, but if you're in game five of Worlds and basically they're giving you last pick, you can pick whatever champion you want. Who, you, who do you want to pick? I mean, that's like a weird question, bro. You would, I, have, to give meta, me, you would have to give me like five champions that are picked on enemy team <laughs> who, and four champions on you, my team. Who would you feel like you'd want to play? Like, they're like, they want you to carry this game. I mean, that's, I, I think I would play Graves. Like, the Graves is the, hi, Graves is the highest chance that he would be fitting good into the team comp. Okay. But obviously if they're like control mages picked on both sides and then i lock in graves i might just solo lose the game so <laughs> so so, okay. so i have to see like what's so, so, in front of me gotcha. but so, one champion i would choose grace probably okay is that would you, would you say that's your favorite champion to play uh i think that the champion you can have a lot of impact on because even if he's not picked in the complete like uh, great state i think if you are really good on him you will still be useful or like find find place to be useful yeah. so yeah that's, that's so a, i think i'll just be great very competitive mindset just whatever is good i think you know who, yeah. you know who else said that actually, or, or listen if listen is in meta I would also I, be okay that's what i'm going for i've seen your listen warm-ups it's nuts uh <laughs> yeah um but yeah the, the other player that i talked to before that was uh that said i'd play whoever is good it was jojo <laughs> yeah yeah he was just I like mean, whatever is meta <laughs> yeah whatever is whatever is good and i think it's gonna feed good if, with our champs and against enemy champs yeah. And I'm gonna pick it. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Casper. It was really good talking to you again. Thank you. Hopefully, I get to see you soon uh, when you get yep. out here. And three uh, weeks, I think, or something like that. I should be already in a in three weeks. Awesome. Travel safe. Have an amazing holiday, and uh, I'm really excited to watch you play again this split. Uh, thank I've you. said I've said for a very long time. I think when you showed up, the level of jungling in North America just got better. You know, it's like everybody had to play better because yeah. the stuff that they would get away with before you you're just punishing like the the first split when you started uh dominating this you know with eg it was like you're just punishing everything <laughs> yeah so yeah i love to see it all right cool thank, thank you. you for your time have a good night and uh, thank you we'll see thank you, you back. all right see ya take care